What's up, you AP Human Geographer? How are you doing? It's Coach White. I'm back here. I'm going to be talking about cities and urban patterns today, so you better buckle up and stop procrastinating. Go ahead and click like, please. All right, so let's start with the beginning. So our first cities uh, would be known as urban areas, and these urban centers will pop up in uh, what would be called these the Mesopotamia, the Middle East, Southwest Asia, the Fertile Crescent between the Tigris and Euphrates River here. So you can see these, uh, this area known as Mesopotamia. And you can also see just after this, this urban revolution took place. It kind of takes place like um, in the similar areas. And you'll notice they have something in common. The Nile, Mesopotamia, Indus, um, the the Yellow River, and in Mesoamerica. They all are around the same line of latitude. These are some of the oldest urban centers. And an urban center is defined as people living in, in uh, groups together. And uh, yeah, you can see our first one. So our oldest one is right here, right in Sumer. Today, you can see the biggest cities in the world are located here. You'll still notice most of them are on coast. People like to live on bodies of water and coast. That's one of those, those facts. We can see a lot are in East Asia and Southeast Asia. So they have most of the large cities. But let's keep looking at some of these terms. All right, so how do we rank these urban hierarchy? Right, I use the upside down triangle method, right? Big at the top, small at the bottom. So the smallest urban center is called a hamlet, which very few of these uh, exist in most modern modern day societies. Then you have a village, a little more common, a town, a city, a metropolis, and then a megalopolis, or as my kids will say, a megalopolis, all right? So these six different types of classifications are used to decide like and decipher how large is a city and how important is it? So I tried to use some imagery here and some numbers. So a hamlet, less than 500 people, not a whole lot of uh, functional regions and zones not not going on village you have between 500 to 2500 people and these aren't exact numbers it's just trying to tell you right where we live right here in Duluth is a town right we're between 10 and 100,000 people above that is a city right 100,000 to a million then a metropolis which a metropolis just so you know is the city plus its surrounding suburbs and we'll talk more about that in a second and then a megalopolis or a megalopolis has 10 plus million people. You can also see they generally connect multiple metropolises together using what's known as urban sprawl. All right. Sometimes we'll use this thing called rank size rule. And this is a, a way to predict the size of a city in a country. So if you give, if you're given a country and we tell you, all right, the largest city is 12 million people. We want to know how big is the fourth largest city. And so what you do is you find, all right, well, the largest city is 12 million. The rank size rule says one over N. So if N is the fourth, right? So that'd be one over four. So one fourth of 12 would be 3 million. So we can see Kittyzilla here, 12 million. The second largest city would be 6 million. Now you don't want to half it again. A lot of kids will half it again. And they'll be, oh, well, it'd be 3 million. No, remember it is one third of 12. So a third of 12. So whatever rank it is, so you can figure out the 72nd, one 72nd of 12 million. I don't know what that number is. I did it all the way down here to the, uh, that's three, four, five, the seventh. All right. So you can see that. And sometimes I'll have you figure this out on the test. They usually like to use 12 because it divides by three and four uh, pretty easily. Um, all right. Sometimes you'll have a country that has what is known as a primate city. And a primate city is a city that either represents the culture of the people or it represents the culture and it has more than twice as the second city. So like London and Paris are primate cities. All right. And these cities not only dominate the culture and the arts and the in of, uh, of England and France, they also have, look at that, Paris has 9 million. Marseille, the second largest city, has 2 million. So you cannot apply the rank size rule if a country has a primate city. So that's another little fun fact. Sometimes you'll hear about this thing called a world city. And a world city or a global city or alpha city is basically it's important for financial connections and global trade. And you can see these red ones exist. These are alpha cities. They're always on the coast for the most part or on a big river. Sometimes you'll have... Uh, and our first world city was Liverpool, and I like this because of soccer connections. But Liverpool's on the coast. Liverpool had a relationship with Manchester. Manchester made all the T-shirts, 
and all of that, and Liverpool shipped them everywhere. So Liverpool was the very first world city. Sometimes you'll hear this phrase, mega city, right? And mega city is where I like to go for my fireworks during the 4th of July. But mega city here is going to be a city that's very large. It has to have 5 million people. And for a while, that was good enough. But guess what? The human population keeps going up. So now there's a new type of classification. You ready? You ready? Hold on to your pants. Here it is. Meta city, right? Sounds like an even bigger fireworks depot. And a meta city has to have more than 20 million people. We can see some of these are down here in South Asia and in East Asia. These are massive, massive cities. All right. Now let's talk about cities. So the cities are growing. We looked at the first cities and we're looking at term terminology for huge cities. But these things around cities pop up between the farms. So the farms are in rural areas. The cities are in those urban areas. The suburbs are that in between. And the suburbs will grow mostly after the second or excuse me the industrial revolution which is around 1800 so what's happening is people move to the city and they start working in these factories they want to get off of the farm remember the agricultural revolution the second agricultural revolution starts then and what starts happening is roads get better and better and transportation gets easier and easier that time space compression gets a little bit smaller people want to move out of the cities and live in this area between uh, what's known as the cities and uh, the rural area known as the suburbs. And here's kind of how it works, right? There's the farm that you live on, right? That's the rural. There's the city that you worked in the factory over here. They got to leave the farm to move and to work in the factory, right? So they move into the city. They're in this bubble now. They're living close to work is awesome, right? The problem is there's pollution. There's more like sickness, crime, um, and people will start to get cars in the 1940s. 40s and 50s, and they're going to want to start to commute. And so you have this middle area known as the suburbs. So that's the growth of the suburbs starts then. Sometimes you have these places called boom burbs. And I like the phrase boom. That's a good prefix there. But a boom burb is when a suburb actually becomes almost self-sufficient. So if you look in Miami or Miami, uh, Miami is a massive American city. And just north of it, you have the city of Boca Raton. And it used to be a suburb. But what happened is this suburb actually grew and became its own city. So when the when the suburb becomes its own city, it's known as a boom burb. It's still technically a suburb of Miami, but it's massive. You have another one, right? Right here in Duluth. We live really close to what's called an excerpt. So you have Metro Atlanta is this red area. These are This is the city of Atlanta and the surrounding suburbs. But the very northern part, right, this is Gwinnett County, the very northern part houses two, two schools that are pretty far north. And these have what's known as the exurbs. It means they're, they're so far away and removed that they almost don't even rely on the, on the city. And what's also happening is you have this growth in the cities with this new urbanism movement. And this is the whole movement. You can see here, this is in downtown Atlanta. This is an old factory that got run down and people moved out and moved away. And they come in and they revitalize it and they try to make it a place where people can live, work, and play. So at Pond City Market is cool. You can actually live in the top few floors. You can eat and shop in the bottom floors. And then you actually, there's workspace in the center floors. And it has a high walkability. You can see these uh, in bikeability. These ladies and this guy are walking around. And so it makes it where there's less traffic. And it's this growth and renewal inside the city. This growth and renewal is often called gentrification, which is both good and bad. I encourage you to watch a Vice documentary about it. But basically, you can see it's when old run-down things become... Um, new and, and bright and shiny again. And the good news is it, it revitalizes. The bad news is it typically will raise rent prices. So people that have been living there for a long time and on fixed income no longer can afford it, all right? That's gentrification's plus and minuses. Now we got to talk about the models. Central place theory. This is something that's often on the AP exam. The central place theory, I wrote a great rap about it. You should check it out. I'll put the link in the description. But the central place theory is this idea that um, you could make a hyper-efficient city if it had flat surface, no barriers, the soil is fertile, population is equal, and transportation is equal as well. And it would look like this, all right? So you have the central place is the market where people, they come together and they, and they, uh, they, they work and they trade. And they have these businesses and they have what's known as a threshold. And a threshold is the minimal market needed to keep this business. So let's say you have a, a restaurant here. You would need a minimum amount of business to keep it in business. You also are trying to attract what's known as the hinterlands or the suburbs in. And this would be a complementary region because 
what's happening here is the people in the suburbs actually work at the central place. The central place needs them to work and both shop there. The better your your uh, your business competes, it has more centrality, which is the idea that it's it's attractive. It's like in Atlanta, we have an IKEA that's very attractive. There is a there's a lot of centrality there, but that IKEA only has a certain amount of range that it can draw people in. Right? People aren't coming from all over the country to this IKEA, but it does have a range, and so. You're probably like, well, why does it have this weird shape? Why does it look like a hexagon? Well, the reason it looks like a hexagon is because when Walter Christoller was making it, he realized circles were inefficient because there's this gap. And he realized there's either a gap and, oh, no, they don't get Ikea. Or there was, right here, there's overlap. Oh, no, there's too much Ikea. And then they realized, all right, well, the hexagons, much like bees, right, fit together perfectly. They're very efficient and it describing this. The last thing we're going to look at are city models. I know you're thinking, yes, finally, Coach White, beautiful people to look at. Not quite. Now, while there may be beautiful people in these cities, we're going to be looking at the city models. And these city models are things they often ask about on the test. And it tries to describe the growth and the change of these, the, the, the typical city in America first. All right. The first one we're looking at is from the 1920s called the concentric zone model. And this one really focuses on what's known as the CBD or the central business district. And it was developed by a man named Ernst, Ernest Burgess. And he based it around Chicago. And he realized that the, the most important node was in the center. And as you get further and further away from it, land value decreases using that bed rent theory. Uh, it's a dynamic model and it's changing. And they realized soon after they had to change. And we can see Indianapolis, right, used to, uh, we can see the concentric zone displayed in Indianapolis there. Then it transformed into what's known as the sector model. And the sector model is less concentric rings. It's more of these wedges. And so now the CBD is still very prominent, but now because of the growth of factories and transportation, there is this model described by Homer Hoyt in the 1930s. And it's sh showing that people are starting to expand outward and there's new residential patterns coming in in different types of classes from low, middle, and high income. Then we can, oh yeah, sorry, got ahead of myself. We can see that in Indianapolis as well with this uh, distribution of income. You can see the sector model displayed. Then it'll grow into the 40s after World War II, the multiple nuclei model. And the multiple nuclei model is starting to really stretch out. So the first two are high, hyper concentrated around the CBD or the central business district. The multiple nuclear model was made by Harrison Ullman. And this is all about suburbanization and the growth of cars and automobiles. And it leads to the growth of what's known as edge cities. And the edge cities would be now the CBD is not as important. People are living further away. They have cars and these new edge cities are going to pop up. All right. This is all about suburbanization. It'll also turn into the galactic model, which again, you can see it's starting to stretch and stretch and stretch. And you can see the edge cities are starting to really be prominent here on the outside. There's more urban sprawl because there are more cars. And obviously this one starts around Detroit, or as the French call it, Detroit, and the Motor City. So we can see this transformation here. Today, most American cities are using what's known as the urban realms and the edge cities. So we can see the growth and the transition there. And the urban realms was made uh, with the edge cities becoming almost more important than the main city and CBD and developing their own kind of flavor. And if you think of like Atlanta, like this could be like downtown Atlanta, there are these suburbs that have become edge cities in essence uh, all around them. And they have different like tasks and, and, um, and nodes to fit together. And these, these components work together, different uh, social complexities here. All right, Gwinnett County in and around Atlanta is like that. You can see this one, LA has lots of urban realms. So if we look at the, the evolution of these typical US cities, we can see in the 20s, started the concentric, then the 30s starts to change into Homer Hoyt's uh, sectors. After World War II, growth of cars, there's a lot more suburbanization that'll eventually lead to the galactic, which will transform into uh, the urban realms model seen here. Okay, that is the transition of the, the cities in America. Now let's go all around the world. We can see most Latin American cities will have this type of model uh, associated with them. They have the spine, which is like the promenade where people walk, there's malls, and it's high, high rent, followed by disamenity. So you have the highest class people and the poorest people living very close together in uh, most Latin American cities. And we can see that um, right here. If we look in Rio, look at this. You have the favelas here of Brazil, and then you have these 
luxurious condos as well, right next to each other. So that one's highlighted by the Griffin Ford model of Latin America. In Southeast Asia, you can see the focus on the port zones. We see those with the these special economic zones are always important around there. And this has to do with the colonial history of the, the colonizers bringing in all of these goods. The last one we're going to look at is the Sub-Saharan African or the African City model. And this one made by Harm de Blee. And this one is interesting because it has its traditional CBD. Then it has this market zone. Then it has the colonial CBD from the imperialist age. And so these have different... Um, different ideas, different uh, looks to them. And we can see most of these uh, are found um, along the coast as well. So the coast is very important to these. And you can see down here in Lagos, Nigeria, it is uh, very much um, su subscribing to this uh, African city model. Now, I hope that was helpful and hopefully a short and brief. I know you're going to go take a three, four, or five on this AP exam coming up in May, and you have a great day. This is Coach White, and I'm out.